Isn't this exciting? To be back in our church is just a glorious, glorious privilege. Thought about it this morning, because we know we have neighbors that realize we go to Sunday's church on Sabbath, and I thought, I wonder what Monty is thinking about this morning as he sees us getting into our car and dressed up. Will he have a better, more enjoyable, exciting Sabbath morning than we will? I mean, he can mow his lawn, he can go play ball, he could uh, clean up the yard, but we are going to fellowship and worship. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. Being able to do that is just so wonderful, and it's just uh, something I've been anticipating all week, and we want to welcome those that are also... Uh, watching on Zoom and live stream. And I understand Brian and Ron yet. Hmm? You do have you. Okay, so that should be on the screen as well, Brian. So we're starting off with the Sabbath School lesson for uh, this quarter. And as we begin with our days for a word of prayer. Lord, it is exciting to study your word and to stand before the, those that are gathered here and those coming in on Zoom. We are just grateful to be able to share in the Bible together and learn its steps and its gems uh, that we have the opportunity of sharing it today. And we invite your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. So for this lesson this morning, uh, Celeste will be helping me. Anyone that, she's on Zoom, she can't be both at the same time, Zoom and live stream. So those of you who are on Zoom, uh, if you have answers or questions, you send them on the chat room. And from time to time, uh, Celeste will give you the signal and we'll have the opportunity uh, to hear what you have to say. We're studying this week uh, the title of Sharing the Story of Jesus. And when you look at that title, there are just some simple assumptions in that title. If you're going to share, that means it's something from you, either verbally or written or in gestures is some type of expression from you that you are communicating to others and you're sharing the story of Jesus assumes that you that you must know something about Jesus because if you have nothing to share you better not say very much so today we're going to talk about our communication about our loving Savior uh, with others and how we can do it better and we're going to be I have an introduction first, and then we'll be going into different days, and I'll tell you which days we're going to be into as we discuss them together. So for introduction, I thought about sharing Jesus, a text that came to mind. If you want to turn to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. It's a very insightful thought here that maybe you haven't uh, put your finger on before. In Hebrews 1, it says, now listen carefully to this verse. God, who in various times and sundry ways spoke, God spoke in times past to the fathers, that would be the people of the Old Testament, by the prophets. So that part of the verse says that God has communicated to people in Old Testament times through what medium? The prophets. So did the prophets say their own words? No. God communicated through them what he wanted to communicate. Now, the next part of the verse says, he has in these last days, that's from the time of the New Testament, including our times, he has in these last days spoken to us by whom? The Son. So, in these last days he's spoken to us by the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So in Old Testament times it says, God spoke through the prophets to us. So when the prophets spoke, what message, what was the source of the message that came from the prophets? It was God's message. Now let me ask you, when you look at the New Testament, has it changed? No, it has not changed. It's still the message of God, but instead of through the prophets, in New Testament times, it's through whom? Jesus. And that's why Jesus in John chapter 17 says, Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. That is significant to realize that the one who is sharing in both Old Testament time and New Testament 
Testament time, through the prophets or through Jesus, it's the, it's the message of God the Father. And that's why Jesus said, I have come to glorify the Father. And so when we take a look at the story of Jesus, who should be glorified? It should be the Father. That is Jesus' intention. Jesus says, I come to glorify the Father. That is my intention. All right, now, going to the memory verse, which is John chapter 5 and 13, 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So this is a message through the Father, through John, about Jesus. And what is that message? Those of you who believe in Jesus, it says there are two things that are important in this verse. And notice what the first thing is. Those of you who believe in Jesus, what's it? So those of us that are here, I want you to speak up loudly, and I'll repeat it to those that are coming in Zoom, because we are in the class. Those that are in the class, speak up loudly, I'll repeat it to those that are coming in by Zoom. So those of you who believe in Jesus, God through, mentions through John, those of you who believe in Jesus, what can you know according to this verse? Yes, that you have have eternal life. And what's the second thing? And that you continue, right, to believe in the name of the Son of God. So does God the Father want you to continue to believe in Jesus? Not just, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I have eternal life through Him. It's a gift. Thank you, Lord. And God said, yeah, yeah, but I don't want you just to believe that. I want you to continue to believe. It's not a one-time thing. It's a continuous lifestyle, something that you have. Now, when you take a look at, so the, the question is, if the Bible says that if I believe in Jesus, I, I ripped in these things to you so that those of you who believe in Jesus may know that you have eternal life. So John says, that's why I ripped in them. So the question that comes to me is, how do you know? He's written it, yeah, but is there any way that you actually can know? It's written down, but is there any other? So I'm thinking of the verse in Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 16. The Bible declares how you can know, not just from reading the Bible, but there is some specific way the Bible says that you can know. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? Sons of God. So how can you know that you have eternal life? If you are allowing the Holy Spirit to lead in your life, you can know. But I like verse 16 a lot. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. So if I were to ask you, Bridget, how do you know that you are a child of God? According to this verse, what could you say? According to this verse, how would you know, how could you know that you're a child of God? According to verse 16. What evidence would you have? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. Have we all experienced the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Yeah, it talks in, in uh, John. It says the Spirit convicts us. He brings to our attention uh, where we're out of harmony with God, what God's standards are. And so the Spirit speaks to us. All of us have had the Holy Spirit speaks to our conscience. And it says in the Bible, God will take the initiative to speak to you. So if the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to speak to you, one of the first things he'll tell you is not where you 
got to straighten out. One of the first things he'll tell you is, you have accepted Jesus. You are now a child of God. You are now a child of God. That's beautiful. You're part of the family. So it's not only the reading these things I've written to you so you can know. The Bible says not only by reading, and you can accept it by reading, but I'm going to take the issue to speak to you so that you can know. Now, a question I have after this is, what is the greatest influencing factor in your life of the following five? I'm going to list five things, and I'd like you to choose which one influences you the most over the love of receiving the story of Jesus. What has the greatest chance of influencing you? So think of these five and then pick one out that you think is the greatest influencer in your life. A convincing, logical argument. Is that the greatest convincing thing in your life? A capable community leader. Will they convince you beyond shadow of a doubt? A changed person's claim to be a Christian. Would that convince you? When the majority of the people in the community favor it, will that convince you? Parents or grandparents embracing it, will that convince you? What is the biggest influencing factor in your life that will convince you to love Jesus? So I'm going to go over those again. One was logical argument, capable leaders in the community, a changed Christian's life, the majority of the people saying, or my parents and grandparents, I will do what they want me to do. So pick one of those. Which would you say is the biggest influence that has the greatest chance for you coming to love Jesus? How many say convincing, logical arguments will do it for me? Anybody? Doesn't seem to be any takers here. Capable community leaders in our surroundings. Would that be the biggest influence for you? A changed person's life, one who claims now to be a Christian. And I see several hands in our group. Okay. When the majority of the people in the community decide, that will be the biggest influence for you. No takers. Parents and grandparents. If they embrace it, that's the biggest influence for me. Well, in our group, I'm not sure about out there, but in our group, the one that seemed to come to the top is when you see a person's life change, that is one of the biggest persuaders in your life. So people are looking for Christ's love to be lived out before them. Now we're ready to go into Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson. Jesus the basis of our testimony. How does God get our attention? And so my first question to you today, based upon Jesus, the basis of our testimony, my first question is this. How close will God come to forcing you to love Him? Now that's the struggle every parent has. A child is growing up, you want to have them love Jesus. And there's a struggle sometimes between forcing and persuading. And so the question I have, God wants you to love Jesus. He is the basis of, of our testimony of what he can do in my life. And so my first question is, how close will God come to forcing you to love him? We have one, one lady. Okay, we have a comment. This is from Louise Ramlow. And she said, I was baptized over 50 years ago in Botwood, but strayed away from the church beliefs and was taken off the books, which made me really mad at God and the church. I thought the Lord's Supper was there for us to confess, 
I never gave up on God, and he never gave up on me. Amen. Amen. And then there's Jonathan. It says, yes. It is not lagging as much. Sorry, I was responding to a question about the video. <laughs> right. Okay. And uh, again, um, Zenia said, Louise, Jesus never gives up on you. Thank you. And I thought about how uh, persuasive is God, and does that persuasion ever embrace a coercion? Uh, a text that came to my mind, if you'd like to look it up, is Galatians 3, 1 to 3. Galatians 3, 1 to 3. What uh, Paul says to the church in Galatia. Galatians 3, 1 to 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed? among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the learning of faith? Are you so foolish? Have you begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect in the flesh? What a picture of persuasion. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should what? You should respond. You should not obey the truth. And then it says, what was it that was portrayed that was there to persuade you? It was Jesus who was what? Crucified. If that can persuade you, if that can persuade you, Jesus on the cross, there is nothing that really is going to persuade you. The, the God so loved, and it mentions in, um, in, in Romans 8, but God, he demonstrated his love for you in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Amen. Christ died for you. And so he said to Galatians, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you have turned away from Jesus, who was portrayed before you as crucified. That's the closest coercion text that I can think about. And what kind of text is it? Is it coercion? Is it force? Or is it a portrayal of his love? And he says, won't you respond to my demonstration of love for you as expressed on the cross? That's a very important thought. God will not use coercion. Is there anyone, no one raise their hand, that will admit yeah, there might have been a few times that I <clears throat> used a little bit of heavy hand to have my child uh, come in line uh, to love the Lord. <laughs> we probably all have done it because you come to a frustrating point. Two, two, cross, uh, two points there. One is I don't want them to make a wrong decision, and so I'll pull on in. Or uh, I want them to make a right decision, and so you will do it. And it's so easy. And of course, there is a time when the child is not making and doesn't have the ability to have that freedom of choice, uh, that they are to respond. But there is a point in time when they, uh, when they mature that you know that they have to make the decision for themselves. So God does not use coercion, and that uh, we're not used to that because we lean to that so easily. So the next question I have is, what was Paul's feeling about gaining this knowledge of Jesus that we're talking? Jesus is the basis of our testimony. What was Paul's feeling about gaining knowledge of Jesus? 1 Corinthians 2.2. 1 2. Corinthians 2.2. 2. How important was it uh, to Paul to gain the knowledge of Jesus? Someone that's here would like just to read that text out nice and loud. 1 
song, but let's see how many you can pull out. Are we, as human beings, the only voices in the world to testify about Jesus? Are there any other voices that testify about Jesus that's happened in this world? Can you think of any other voices, any kind of voices that testifies about Jesus? The Spirit is talking about the devil. The devil. The Spirit of the devil. Well, that's an interesting one. I didn't put that down. But that is true, isn't it? What did the spirit of the demoniacs, you know, have you come here to, to, uh, yeah, 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 you're right on there, Ed. The, the, the devil, the devil's even declared Jesus. Okay. Good. And, 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 and the, the, the first missionary, strange, the first, the first disciples were demons. Uh, uh, those people who were sick. The uh, first missionaries were, were the ones who were, uh, uh, weren't allowed to go around people because there was something wrong with them. Yes. They were going crazy because they were filled with different spirits and so on. Okay. And, and Jesus came and healed them. And Jesus healed uh, one and two and whatever. And they went out and, and spread the word. Because they they visibly said, yeah, we know that guy. He was, he, he was crazy. Look at him now. He's yeah. saying that. Oh, we're going to come to that story. Okay, pull that one. Play the way field. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he was declared uh, the story of Jesus. Any other voices that uh, you picked up uh, in the Bible that declared of Jesus other than the human beings? Yes, what is the heavens what? The heavens declare the glory of God. Right, so nature, the heavenly beings, heavenly place, places and the stars and that. The heavens declare the glory of God. Alright? I have three more listed here that, that I spotted in the Bible. Their names when you hear them. Thank you, Bridget, for that. Any other voices? What about the birth of Jesus? Just a hint. <laughs> Who declared Jesus there? Angels. Angels, right. Thank you, Jason. Angels declared born in Bethlehem, the baby Jesus. What about the baptism? Who declared Jesus at the baptism? He, uh, yeah, but he's a human being. What happened? After he came up out of the water. Yeah, the voice of the Heavenly Father. This is mine. Okay, now John 15, 26 is the last one. I was sitting there, have others. And John 15, verse 26 is very significant because it says, but when he, the Helper, comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth proceeds from the Father, he will do what? Testify of me. So Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's work is to testify of Jesus, which is very interesting. Jesus said his work was to testify of the Father. The Holy Spirit's work was to testify of Jesus. What is our work? Testify of Jesus. We are to testify of Jesus. Who testifies of the Father? Of the Father. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us to give a clear testimony. But the work of the Holy Spirit will exalt Jesus. That's why anyone who claims to be filled with the Holy Spirit and does not exalt Jesus is suspect. Yes, go ahead, uh, Larry. Yes, even the wicked declare the name of God. And in James 2, 7, and 7, right? They blaspheme that word in name by what you is called. So even the wicked do testify of Christ. So, so Larry says, even the wicked will testify. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, when you think of some of the stories of the Old Testament of those that were wicked that acknowledge God. Yeah, think of Pharaoh. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. Even the wicked will declare. All right, let's see now. Uh, think very carefully on this question. Is our testimony about Jesus the same as our glorifying Jesus. Now think about that. Is our testimony about Jesus the same as our glorifying Jesus? Is the word testimony and glorifying synonymous? Are they together? 
Bible for himself, went beyond what his friend and neighbor, uh, where he was, and he's and it led him to the subject of his church. But it was started by a changed life of someone who genuinely moved from where they were, and that's uh, that's that's a very very um, that's a very important point, which brought and I'm not sure I'm going to skip down to the thought because it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, if you are talking to a sincere Christian who loves the Lord, and you're giving them an accuracy of knowledge of what the state of the dead, but you don't have confidence in your salvation in Jesus, what influence will it have on the person who's listening? Let me repeat that. If you're talking to a sincere Christian in our community of another church that loves the Lord, and you are giving them the accurate knowledge of the state of the dead, but you do not have, and you tell them, you do not have the certainty of your salvation in Jesus, what type of influence will that have in persuading that person? Non-negligible, but you have accurate knowledge. Shouldn't that have persuading power? I would, I would say pity. I would have pity on that person and want to persuade them. <laughs> I have heard other Christians say in times past about persuading: "You can keep your truth; you will keep Jesus." Have you ever heard that? We don't have Jesus, you keep your... Yeah, you got to believe it first, because the um, Bible says that that we believe is actually the power, right? So the power doesn't come from um, just sharing the head knowledge. The power comes from our belief and our conviction. Yes. The Spirit of God using us to share that belief and the power of God's word and what it can do. So that's why I would say it needs to start from first... You gotta be, you gotta be playing yourself before you can start going off conference with your I mean, Pastor Jamie is bringing up that, that you yourself need to be saved before you have. Now, in saying that, I can think of a specific person that has been part of my life in the past um, who was converted and was baptized, gone down on a struggling journey. Left the church, and so no longer he professed, but he's out there with all his friends telling you about the accuracy of Bible teachings. And some of those people end up coming to church on their own, <laughs> which was a testimony of someone who was a former believer. And they actually have a circle of influence of the people that they bump shoulders with that make some of those people who are sincere think about it. Um, so it's, it's a little bit like uh, Romans, right, where it says, God says, I raised you up, Pharaoh, so I can be glorified because I knew that you would resist me. And it will be an opportunity for me to demonstrate who I am in delivering the people. So like Larry said, the Lord can use whoever he wants uh, to bring glory uh, to him. Um, all right, let's go into Monday's lesson. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to ask a true and false question. Be ready to uh, raise your hand. True or false? Most people do not want to take the time to read for themselves. They want to know from you what has being a Christian done for you. How significant does this make to your testimony? Is that a true or a false statement? How many feel that's true? I see several hands. How many feel it's false? Okay, most people, is, is it true? Most people say, look, I don't have time to read all too closely. You demonstrate it, and I will evaluate what it's done in your life and then I will see if it's something that interests me or not. Uh, is that a reasonable? I know I've had people come 
to me with stacks of tapes, I mean hours of tapes, and said, you need to listen to this. This is something that is important for the present day. And what's been my response? You tell me what you found in those tapes, I'll give you a few minutes. What has it done for you? What should I know? Is that reasonable? Or do I need to say, oh, okay, I'll spend the 60 hours listening to those tapes. No, I'm, I am at that time. And it's the same with anyone, whether it's, whether it's a person of another Christian religion or a foreign religion. You tell me what it's done for you. You tell me what the benefit is, and I will evaluate that. I think we all lean that way, don't we? We want, we want someone to summarize it for us, someone who's part of themselves. Now, one of the most important persuaders that you and I have is our personal testimony. And people generally cannot argue on our personal testimony. This is what it's done to me. And there are three steps to your personal testimony, and it's not difficult. All of us should be able and willing to give our personal testimony. Three stages. Number one, tell a little bit of what your life was before you met Jesus. Now, I'm not asking, I'm not stating, some people go into gory, detailed, down in mud, right? Well, you have to use, I think you have to use wisdom. And I think sometimes our testimony in that area can be a persuader or encouragement for people to go that way. And we don't want that. But what I was like, tell a little bit of what I was like before I met Jesus. Number two, tell how you became involved with Jesus and how it impacted you to make the decision. So here's what I was like before I met Jesus. And here I was like, here's how I met him and what impact it's had on me. And the third part, tell a little bit what it's been like since you've accepted him. The journey that you've had in life since you accept. So a little bit about what it was like before I met Jesus, how I met Jesus and the impact it had in my life, and then finally, this is what my journey has been like since then. That's called a personal testimony, and each of us should feel comfortable in sharing that. Not a long, long story. You've got an hour, I'll tell you, no, no, you've got to be able to say that within five minutes. It's called a personal testimony, and each of us should be ready at a moment to share our personal testimony. Now, that led to a question for me, and I'm going to answer the question, but I want you to answer your question. That is, what Bible character, what Bible character has had a significant influence on your life? So when you think of all the stories of the Bible, what Bible character would you say has had a significant influence on your life. Anyone want to volunteer one? Yeah, go ahead, Larry. Joseph. Joseph. How has Joseph influenced your life? I cannot read the story of Joseph that we that from. I never, ever read that story. And I'm not reading a lot of times, but every time I read it, because every time in those young men, you know, what it was said, well, he's bragging, right? Like Job. What do you like about Job? I like that Job never gave up on God. Yeah, 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 right. Anybody else has a favorite character that really has impacted their life? Those are good. One that's impacted mine, of course, we all can have more than one. But I have really, I heard what this say, Celeste. Lot's wife. <laughs> Lot's wife. <laughs> One that's had an impact on their life is Lot's wife. <laughs> uh, One that has a real impact on my life is uh, Noah. 
uh, Noah. And the reason that I find Noah that is because Noah's an ordinary guy, right? He was an ordinary guy, and God looks down and says, who can I choose to prepare the world uh, for the great flood? And Noah found grace. He found favor because he had qualified himself for the task that God was looking for someone to fulfill. And I have found, God, I want to be qualified that you can use me for your glory, for the purposes you have. And as I think about Noah and the favor that he received in being chosen to help prepare a people, I really find that impacting on my life. And I want to be a better person uh, because of the type of person Noah was. Anyone else want to cover one before we go on to next? Yeah, go ahead. Abimelech? Yes. My sister. Uh, you're a dead man. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, that's uh, interesting. Abimelech, who uh, God came to and said, hey, you have another man's wife. And he says, out of the integrity of my heart, I took her, you know, I, which, showed, which showed that the Holy Spirit had been working in that man's heart, right? He, he, had, to he, had, he had to know the principles, yes, yes. There was a Daniel as well. Someone Matthew, says Daniel, Daniel. Matthew said that. All right. Uh, number uh, true and false question again, and we're down to our last few minutes. Let's see. Uh, true or false, it's virtually impossible to convince someone of something that you're not convinced of yourself. Is that true or false? How many think that's true? Virtually impossible to convince someone else of something you're not convinced of yourself. Some truths. Anyone think that's false? Uh, so how important it is for us to be convinced of what we believe. It doesn't mean that you can't grow. It doesn't mean that there's not some developments that can take place, but what you know today, you're fully convinced on, but always open to study, always open to grow, but be fully convinced on what you believe as you understand it today. Okay, let's see. Let's go down to Thursday for the last minute or so. Um, can have more good times. True or false? Now, this one you've got to think of very carefully because it, it is significant as a Christian. True or false? A non-Christian, someone who's not a Christian, doesn't love the Lord. True or false? They can have more good times in life than a Christian. In fact, being a Christian means your love life is less fulfilling than being a non than your non-believing neighbors. True or false? <laughs> How many think it's true? How many think it's false? How many got confused by the question? <laughs> That's a very important question. If you look at the media, do they give the impression that walking on the wild side is the best way to have life? Do they show the full picture? What does the Bible say? In Psalm 84, 11, it says, no good thing, zero, no good thing will God withhold from those that walk uprightly. 1 John 1, 4 says, these things I write to you that you may, your joy may be full. If you think that the devil can give you a better time than God, then you are saying, no, let me put it a different way. If you think that you can have a better time 
being a non-Christian than a Christian, then you are saying that the devil is a source of a better life than Jesus is. Isn't that true? And that's what a non-Christian thinks. Now, I added that last one. I'm not going to go into it, but it's good for a family discussion. Even your intimacy is more fulfilling as a Christian than a non-Christian because who is the source of true love? Who's encouraged to live unselfishly? Who is to be one who is forgiving and understanding? Who is to be one that's here to serve and to encourage and fulfill the other? It's a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that all Christians are having a greater fulfilling in it, see, because many of them don't live up to that or come to that. But what I'm saying is you have the potential. And that's important for us to know. And every once in a while in temptation, I have to remind myself, no, the devil does not have more fulfillment in life for me than God. Amen. So even though it appears or it seems to, or it seems enjoyable for the moment, it will not be. It'll end up with gravel in your mouth, hangovers, potential disease, guilt, and loss of relationships. So that's so important so for us to remember. So four faults uh, that you can't have a, a better life. They said that's false, four of them. <laughs> four people said you can't have a better life outside. Okay, I'm gonna be stopping now. Um, Today we're sharing about Jesus, and I will close with Revelation 21.4. Because Jesus came and he gave his life, but God, demonstrating his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took away our death penalty. He took away our condemnation. He took away our guilt. He broke the power of sin, the devil in our lives. He's taken away the second death, and we now stand before God justified as though we've never sinned and declared righteous, and, and God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death, sorrow, or crying. There will be no more pain, for the thorn, former things have passed away. This is all because of what Jesus has done for you and for me. Loving Father, just thank you and praise you that today we can be in your presence worshiping you and studying together. We ask your blessing on us as we gather today in your house of worship and over online those that are visiting with us in St. John's today. In Jesus' name, amen. Rising above the Serengeti landscape is the tallest mountain in Africa, the majestic Mount Kilimanjaro. Surrounded by grazing gazelle, sleepy lions, and the elusive leopards, this land holds wonder and enchantment to excited tourists and the humble people who call it home. I am in Tanzania, and this is AWR 360. Adventist World Radio was brought to Tanzania in 1993, making it the first non-government radio broadcast of its time. Now, over 25 years later, a team of dedicated locals operate 10 stations across the country. Broadcasting in Swahili and Maasai, thousands of people can daily listen to programs in their own language. After seeing thousands of baptisms as a direct result of the radio work, many Seventh-day Adventist churches have become excited and desirous of participating in some way as well. One church decided to sponsor a 21-day sermon series called Rays of Hope. The pastor encouraged the members to use this radio program as a witnessing tool and to share the messages with their friends and family. Mama Miyembe took this to heart and began carrying her little radio with her wherever she went. Mama Miyembe had a garden, and her garden was located close by the town's bar. 
Daily, as she attended to her plants and vegetables, she set down her radio and turned up the volume. Inside the nearby bar, the owner, named Elia, began to listen and take interest. I was so intrigued with what I heard coming from the radio in the garden, I decided to find the channel on my radio so I could hear it better. So while Eliah was serving his customers, he was also listening intently to sermons from the Rays of Hope program. Soon he was not the only one listening. The drunkards who daily came by started to listen and ask questions. Finally, Elias suggested they meet together and listen to the radio instead of drinking. And they all agreed. The owner and his customers began meeting with their Bibles and radio. And as the AWR program presented Bible-based messages, the men discovered precious truths they had never heard before. At the end of the 21-day series, I decided to give my life to Jesus and was baptized. Along with 20 of my customers, it was a joyous day. After their baptism, this new little congregation decided to change their bar into a place of worship instead. They meet together every Sabbath to sing praises and study the Bible. Mama Miembe often joins them with a heart full of joy for what God was able to do through her. I am so thankful for AWR and for the messages of hope that saved us. Is this not an amazing testimony to the power of the gospel? A place of frivolity and drunkenness is now a place of praise and worship to our Creator. And all because one woman was willing to carry her radio with her and let it be heard from her garden. Will you join us in spreading the good news of Jesus to a hurting and dying world? Through your prayers and generous support of Adventist World Radio, light is breaking the darkness and truth is triumphing over falsehood. From broadcast to baptism, this is AWR 360.